Hello everyone. Welcome to another Instagram Live. I am your host Ryan Pyle and I am still in Istanbul. And uh, thanks for tuning in to this series um, and keeping me mentally sane in the process because if it wasn't for all of you listening in and if it wasn't for all of you um, willing to chat with me, it would be, uh, it would be pretty lonely uh, here to be honest. So look, just wanted to let you know again, um, oh, hi Brianna, nice to see you. Good morning to you as well. Uh, just to let you know, if you do happen to miss any of these Instagram live conversations, you can catch them again on my YouTube channel, which is just Ryan J. Pyle, and there's a ton of Tough Rides and Extreme Trek stuff there as well. So I'm talking to Melanie Poulin today, and she is an incredible photographic artist and I'm bringing her in. Okay, and she's coming to us from Los Angeles. So we're gonna talk about photography, art, and the lockdown in LA. And I'm looking hey. forward to it. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you doing? Not, not too bad. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. You like set up on my table. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. nice. So, um, so how's Los Angeles today? It looks very pretty from my windows. <laughs> uh, right. Not getting out, you know, too far. You're allowed to walk around the blocks here and get some exercise. Um, I don't know about you. My doorbell is going off. Sorry. Oh, no worries. <laughs> um, that's that's awesome. So look, uh, so we're we have we have a few friends in common. Obviously, Greg's one of them. Um, yeah. And uh, I was I was chatting with him last week and, and he's, you know, he looks like he's doing well. Um, and, yeah, I love uh, Greg. So how, do you, how, do you, how do you know Greg? You know, the whole watch world. I uh, love watches and um, he he's he's an art lover. So um, I have some watches. He has some art. <laughs> he has some of my, okay. my work. And um, yeah, he's uh, become a pretty good friend. So Greg's amazing. Okay. How about that's, you? That's great. Uh, how do I know Greg? Yeah, through the watch world. Yeah. So I, I've, uh, I've been in talks with a lot of different watch brands over the years to do oh. some uh, work with them on various levels. And, uh, and you know, I ended up meeting Greg through a friend uh, in that world. And, um, yeah, he's been amazing. And um, every time I go to L.A., I always try to catch up with him. Do you have any watches? I have a I have a lot, yeah. Um, oh, you do. Okay. Of various, <laughs> uh, of, of various brands. But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Me too. <laughs> I, but lo before, I love it. Once all... you... What? Oh, go ahead. Once you get into that world, it's like it's a real addiction. I, and I guess like for you, traveling all the time and being on the road, it's like one of the things you can bring with you if you think about it. Like you can actually. Absolutely take it and it's on your wrist it goes with you everywhere which is you know i always as a kid i always thought that was like one of the things you could have on your person that identifies you like you know it's a real identifier whereas like fashion you wear it differently every day watch kind of agreed i'm not wearing one <laughs> no me neither I'm, yeah i'm watching so i was I was very close, actually. I'm, I guess I still am close to signing a deal with a watch company that it was Ooh. just about to happen in January. And then oh, February fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers yeah. crossed they don't pull the deal. Exactly. Yeah, February happened for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> the world the melted down. Got worse. The, par the party true. got worse. Yeah. So is it night? It's night where you are, right? It's very late. It is. It what is. Time? Yeah, it's uh, about. 8 p.m. Oh, okay. It's not that bad. That's crazy. And so in bad. Istanbul, you're not allowed out at all. Um, so right? where are we? Are? Well, let me, let me, let's talk about this at the end. So oh. I have a, I have an agenda. Oh, so okay. first of all, okay, I'm in. I want to learn about you and your photo photography and your art, because I actually was a New York Times um, photographer for 10 years covering China. Oh, and cool. I love photography. And when Greg introduced me to your work, I was like blown away because it's very conceptual. Uh, 
and it's it's art whereas i was more of a documentary photographer mm -hmm. and i'd love to learn a little bit more about you and how you came at your art um in the way you did i'm very fascinated thank you um you know i was always very interested in uh photojournalism and uh, nature photography i kind of got in through my grandmother was a photo editor at Audubon, uh, and she, um, as a child, there were always nature photographers around and these incredible people with like amazing stories. They were always like you, you know, they were always on adventures. They were, you call them and they're on a boat in the middle of the Caribbean taking pictures of who knows what. And, um, you know, meanwhile, I was freezing in New York City as a child. So um, sure. that that was always interesting. It made the world seem bigger to me, and yeah. um, the possibilities were endless. And what, at one point, she was judging a nature contest for Audubon, and um, there were photos laying around of lions and tigers and bears. And um, you know, I asked her. I said, "Which photo won this contest?" And she, she pulled out this photo and it was just a blank white sheet of paper. And I, she goes, this one. <laughs> and I, I was like, well, how does that, how did that win the nature, the giant nature? It was like the show was going to be at the Natural History Museum in New York, like the, whoever okay. won was having a major show. And she said, well, if you look closely at the white paper, you'll see little tiny footprints. I looked and there were these like little footprints. And then she goes, and if you look closer, you'll see where the wings of an owl came down. And I was like, oh yeah, oh, there's all these. She goes, a great photo tells a complete story. So for me, that became, and I mean, it's the same with photojournalism and in a way that was photojournalism. I mean, nature uh, of photojournalism. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so it's uh, like, you're you're looking for the secrets and, and I create those and those are the different, you captured them i created them and those are kind of the two types of photography <laughs> absolutely so uh yeah. zqq here says i always wanted to live in new york and photograph the people because there's always so much going on there and oh, yeah. uh dude like so let's let's go back to you growing up in new york like did you did you go to an art school or did you just go to like a regular high school and take photography classes like how did you how did you learn the technical aspects of photography so I didn't, I just went to a public school, but in New York, it was Greenwich Village. I, I moved to Los Angeles um, in the late eighties, but the, in New York at that time, the public school, like the artists, it was like, everybody was an artist. So it wasn't like you yeah. needed to go to art school. <laughs> it was no, my that's entire amazing, family. Isn't it? To grow up in that environment. Yeah, no, I actually, you know, my ex-husband, he was like, the first quote unquote business person I met and I was like, Oh, whoa, you're weird. You know that. So he seemed weird to me because I, I only really knew artists and, you know, kind of the opposite, I guess, of a lot of people, but yeah, I grew up in, just grew up in that environment. And so I, I didn't even go to college. I just was already photographing and working. And then that college came up. I actually got rejected from art school. <laughs> So that okay. was not a possibility. And then the one I wanted to go to. And then, um, you know, I just thought about it at some point. I was like, I'm already making money. I'm like shooting for Rolling Stone. Why do I need to go to college? Yeah. So kind right. of ended up like I never went to university or college. So sorry. <laughs> yeah, how, how many how many artists and, and storytellers, you know, just just grow up making content and, and creating stories and and, yeah. and yeah. avoiding avoiding the kind of institutionalized um you know art art world or 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 television or film world and just just start right. making as much stuff as they can at a, at a young age yeah i mean it's amazing i was really you know lucky considering what i do i i'd be very unlucky if i was a scientist and trying to skip school and get into science <laughs> right but yeah yeah I was really lucky and uh, you know it was just life experience I think for artists people getting into it it's like and I don't know about yourself did you go to school and did you no know? I I came at it through a totally different way actually I um 
I was a student athlete uh, all through oh. high school and university. I played basketball. And, uh, oh, yeah, I saw and that. Things, yeah. So one of the things I always tell people is, is that when you grow up um, as a student athlete, you grow up, um, you don't, you're not a very well-defined person. Like, you don't have a lot of interests outside of your sports. Um, oh. So I didn't like learn how to play any instruments or learn how to do any photography or really take an interest in anything because I was just training like four hours a day and exhausted all the time. So, wow. um, so when I was done my university career, uh, I, I wasn't good enough to play professional basketball. So that was when I like um, moved to China. And, oh. and I, I, thought, I thought about just moving to China because I thought it would be totally different. And actually, when I started traveling around in China, I realized that um, I loved writing and learning about people and their ways of life and their stories. And I loved photographing people, uh, even though I wasn't very good at, at either one of those things. Um, but over the years, I kind of taught myself how to do it. And because it was China um, and not New York City or Los Angeles, but because it was China, there were very few Westerners or foreigners uh, or Americans or Canadians doing what I wanted to do there. So I definitely got a break um, from being abroad and being so, you know, aware of what was going on in the country that I was living in and reporting on. So uh, wow. I kind of, that's how I came to it. That's amazing. Yeah. It's a, uh, you know, and really interesting. I, I did some work in China and it's like, I mean, I guess you lived there for a long time. I was only there for, I don't know, a month or something. And it's like, just, the you know going into that environment as an american you're so interested in the the different it's such a different culture you know culturally and the um you know it took me it's weird and i don't know how to describe it but it takes your mind a minute to adjust to a entirely different uh race of people because we're still used to seeing like americans here caucasian and then you go there and you're like I'm the only, I'm the one that's weird. I'm in China. Yeah. You're like you, you're like, I remember when I went, people would like follow me and touch my hair because you become like this totally different. You're just, you're everybody's Chinese. Like that sounds silly to say, but that's the truth. And um, then suddenly everybody, uh, suddenly your mind shifts and everybody becomes so unique. You know, so you, I don't know if you had that experience, but suddenly you like, you see past all that and then you're like, oh, that each person is so unique in their own style and their look and their expression. And you, it, you know, I don't know, you go, you break through this moment and into like individuality. <laughs> I don't yeah, know if you have I think that. That's a great way to, I think that's a great way to describe it. One of the ways I describe it in, in some of my work is just saying like going to China is like having all five senses at the same time on overload. Like, yeah, exactly. You're just, you're just being hit by everything all the time. And, and uh, oh one of my favorite, one of my favorite comedians, Trevor Noah, who's the host of The Daily Show, he's got a great comment uh, in one of his stand up comedy shows. He said, if everyone in the world went to a country where they didn't speak their own native language and, and felt that humility and, and felt that humble um, feeling of, of kind of being lost and being in a yeah. foreign land like the world would be a better place. Like, Oh, it'd be so much time. better. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you're Canadian. I'm actually a dual citizen, but I'm, I don't really count as Canadian. I didn't grow up there, but yeah, I think when you go it, to any country, I've traveled a lot, not as much as you, but I, I love traveling. And, um, you know, I, I tend like once a year, I try to go with my backpack, throw on a backpack and, go to a couple countries, which I don't know if I'm going to, how that's going to go anytime soon. But I, I, I do love going to a very foreign country. And, you know, you have this moment where you realize this is not my country. I am not, I'm the little guy here and I have to respect right. the culture. Um, you know, and I think Americans, as we all know, we can make a lot of jokes about Americans, <laughs> but they're very, uh, you know, they're in their own bubble of importance and um you know i try not to do that but the you know it's my world i'm american and you know you really it, it would be great if more americans traveled 
travel well if you're American. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, get, get out. Get a, get a passport and use it. Yeah, use it. And realize you're, you're, there's a much bigger picture in the world. It's not just America, you know, it's like you're, yeah. uh, so, uh, you're kind of stuck where you are right now. You're just totally stuck. We're all stuck, right? We're all stuck, but, uh, I'll get, I'm going to get, okay, I'll tell you my story. I'll okay. tell you my story now. And then we're going to get back to your early days okay. of photography. Cause I'm, I'm really interested on how you caught your first break. Um, okay. but my story is, is that I travel, I live in Dubai and I travel about 300 days a year filming and doing speaking events all around the world. And, uh, in, in February, I went to Myanmar to do an episode of my extreme Trek show, which is on BBC and Amazon prime. And, um, and it went really well, no problems. And then in March, early March, um, I, I was supposed to be filming in Saudi Arabia and then Saudi Arabia closed their borders. And I thought to myself, well, I can probably just go to Africa because my TV show is really like self isolating, like mm -hmm. in the biggest way. Um, like we're out in the mountains for 10, 12 days by ourselves. It's a, us and a small group of people. Uh, you know, we trek about a hundred miles. Uh, we live in tents. Um, so like the show is, is really kind of off the grid. And I, and I, by March, I was so tired of the news and listening to all this garbage every day and, yeah. uh, and just that no one knew what was going on. So I, I flew to Ethiopia, um, to go up to the mountains, the Simeon mountains in Northern Ethiopia on the border with South Sudan. And I was going to do a, a 10 day hike through there and make it one of my episodes of my TV show. And, and then while we were trekking, everything was fine. But while we were trekking, we, we went like two or three days without having a mobile signal. And then all of a sudden we got up to the top of this little mountain and, and our guide was like, okay, guys, check your phones. So we all took out our phones because, because we could get a signal here. And, uh, oh, sorry. And, um, and then it was just like text message after text message after text message. It's like, like Italy has closed its borders. The United oh, States wow. and Europe. Um, Europe has closed its borders. And then the, the last one was that uh, the United Arab Emirates had closed its borders. And, oh. um, and then of course, that's where I live. So, um, so at that moment, I couldn't go home. And there were kind of one or two options. Like I could have gone back to Canada, but then I thought to myself like, well, if I am carrying a virus or, and I don't have any symptoms or whatever, I'm not gonna go stay at my mom's house because she's, She's in the age range that is of the highest risk. Um, gosh, she doesn't like it when I tell people how old she is. So I try to get around that. Uh, She's a young then, um, age. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then, um, but so, but uh, Turkey was open. So Istanbul was open and, and I, and I had, I had no people here and, and I've been to the city before and I loved it. So I just thought, okay, I'm just going to go to Istanbul uh, and wait this out. And, um, and then of course, when I got to Istanbul, it got worse and um and uh now the uae oh, wow. is still closed probably until july maybe longer so i i just moved i was in the hotel for six weeks and i just moved out of the hotel and now i'm in a in an apartment so um i'll be here wow. for the for future and they they let you move in istanbul like that they you were able to actually move um well monday to friday the city is still open like all oh. the shops and restaurants are closed, but the pharmacy, yeah. the grocery store, and some public transport is still working. Mm -hmm. um, but Saturday and Sunday, everything's closed. So yes, I was able to, I was able to find an owner of an apartment wow. that was very nice and he gave me a great deal because it's a COVID-19 special. Yeah. And um, seriously. Yeah. So I'm just waiting here now until, wow. until, you know, who knows how long, again. right? Like nobody yeah. knows. It's crazy. Uh, it what a what a stressful. story! And your whole crew is there with you, like your entire. No, no my guys, my crew <laughs> decided to go. They decided to go back home to uh, oh. North America. Okay, um, wow, that's amazing. They got out. Uh, well, I mean, um, are you like? So you're basically in your apartment, like most of us, at all times. It's it's. Um, you know, I was thinking about you 
with that. It must be like a, like you're like a wild animal trapped in a cage, basically, right? Hi to all my friends. A bunch of my friends keep joining. <laughs> That's Bye. great. If, if, if anyone has any questions for Melanie and I, please ask them. And then whenever there's a break in the conversation, I'll scroll back and, and answer your questions as oh, best yeah. I can. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, so you're like yeah, a wild animal, feel... like yes. trapped in a cage, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, I it's feel that a... way too. It's been, uh, it's weird because we're not really in jail or anything. Like we can still go for walks here. I'm sure, you know, you can go to the grocery store, but it feels there's something like just with the stress for us in this, I live on the 10th floor of a building going down to the lobby, you have to wear the mask and this and that. And a few people have been positive in the building. So it's like, oh, wow. it's scary. You know, you're like, you don't know, there's so much mystery. Like it could just be nothing and odds are it's nothing or you die. <laughs> so right. you're just incredibly careful. And it's a, but it really mentally gets to you, like for me. And I found myself thinking like, I want to go off the grid and live on a sailboat for a year <laughs> after this. Cause you have the whole world then you're not worried about, you know, the city, we all think we own this little property, but in a way it like owns us. It's yeah, I, I think that's a really w great way to say, it. I mean, I mean, I want a big ranch in Colorado, like Hunter S. Thompson, you know, and oh, I can be yeah. the, mayor of, the mayor of a small town or something like that. That's always yeah, exactly. my, my idea of going off the grid, um, <laughs> ending up like a gun wielding uh, rancher. <laughs> well, you're off, you're kind huh? of off the grid. You're kind of off. You're kind of off the grid and like with your team in a way, you know, you're you're generally you're off, like, I guess, Internet grid, but. Um, you're kind of always traveling and all yeah. over. So, you know, lucky. Yeah, I, you. <laughs> um, last year, last year, my claim to fame was that I spent a hundred nights sleeping in a tent and that was, uh, wow. that was wonderful. Yeah. I really love that kind of stuff. So, um, That's just camping, trekking, hiking, I, the physicality wow. of it is, is really lovely. That's amazing. Yeah. I love, I mean, hiking for me and I love rock climbing and, um, I don't go out with my camera. I'm not so inspired by that. Like, that's what's hard about, like, taking pictures during this moment for me is, like, what am I going to do? Go take a picture of the street. Like, whereas maybe you're, you mentally would think of ideas. But I, I have. I just, like, there's a million other photographers doing that right now. So I'm, I'm yeah. looking forward to getting back to, like, when I can set stage stuff and, do my kind of narrative photography but right and, now okay so that's a great segue let's go back yeah. to the early okay days. so yeah. how did you go from a young creative person living in Greenwich Village to working for Rolling Stone as a photographer where how do you make that gap okay so that um it was strange I was kind of working with my grandmother's company she started a company that dealt in stock photography long before hey Greg uh there's our mutual friend, Greg. <laughs> yeah, Greg's in, yeah. Hey. So, uh, yeah, I, I um, went from, uh, you know, I was, sh I was working with her and it was snowing. It was miserable. It actually felt a little bit like the COVID-19 thing in New York. You're like trapped by the snow. Um, and then there was, you know, I kept talking to all the nature guys and they're like out on the boat and this and that. So I, I asked my grandmother, I, I was kind of dabbling in photography and I had a camera, I had a pro set up um, and I never, I've never taken a class on photography. I've never studied it. I just learned, taught myself, try, kind of trial and error back in the day of film. Oh, there, I think, you, you know, a lot, uh, back in the day of film, there was a lot of error and it was expensive and you'd have to buy more film and develop it. Yeah. So, uh, but I asked her, I said, look, how would I get on your stock photography thing and get like going in this? And she was like, well, for you, it's going to be harder than anyone else. And I don't think, she, you know, she tried to talk me out of it. And she, she was like, you'd need five international publications to get them onto the stock thing. And I was like, okay, so that's easy. I have a little checklist. I need five international <laughs> publications. So I came back to LA I was kind of back and forth at that moment. And um, 
you know, within a month, I was just, I was shooting bands. I got hooked up with a magazine starting at the time. And I just started, I did some of the first pictures of the Black Keys and then um, tons of, I worked a lot with Beck and all these. So I was all over. I got published all over and started doing work for different magazines. So I was, I called her and I was like, okay, it's been like a month. I've got the five. But then by that time I moved on, I didn't want to do it. And I kind of, was evaluating what I did want to do. And I realized I wanted to do it as an art photographer, not as a, I didn't want to be a photojournalist. So I started really studying and going to museums and um, every show I could go to. And at the time, photographers were not recognized as artists. The two, you know, artists kind of painters, when I say like artists, I mean like traditional, a painter. Um, you know, I tell somebody, oh, I'm, I want to do this as an art form and they kind of laugh at you and think you were joking or put it down or be negative. And I was like, no, I'm actually doing this. <laughs> so then I, I just kept going and I, I ended up signing with one of the biggest galleries in the world at the time and got offered a massive exhibition. I mean, there's a lot of in between this story. I could fill in the, sure apps of how that happened yeah. but um you know i really i i've always been a firm believer in inertia like once the ball is set in motion it stays in motion i mean for firm believer it is the fact you know so but in life like so i i was like if i keep the ball in motion and i'm still photographing and i'm out there doing this like people will kind of come on board like i'm the ball in motion and so you know, that's really what happened and how I've like lived my whole life. If I want things to like move forward, I, I personally set the ball in motion and then it stays that way. You have to. Yeah. Because no one's yeah. going to push you and no one's going to help. No. And, and I always try to just be the last person standing in the room. That's one of my like mentalities is just, yeah. you know, I'll keep, I'll keep moving and working. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so here, I, Rocky's asking you, was the, was. was the gallery the key milestone in your start? Is that really, did that really set you in motion in the art world? I think for me, so I had a series of things where like people would, you know, I was trying to learn on my own and I, I didn't go to art school. So it was like, I was asking questions and like, what are the rules with the art game? Like if I want to be in great museums if I want to be in a museum or I want a book or I want a gallery like what are the rules how do I do this and nobody knew so it was like nobody had answers but the one thing I did know was I needed to have an art show <laughs> right. so that was really like okay I came across this uh um forensic archive and I got really interested and started hounding the um the LA, the chief of police in Los Angeles at the time was Bratton. He's a little controversial figure in Los Angeles. But I um, started hounding his, him in his office for old forensic files. And I, I realized I wanted to take these crime scenes and recreate them in fashion, kind of tableau, like, um, like a commercial, like a commercial of a crime scene. <laughs> so, I, can, I, can just, I can just jump in here and say, for anyone yeah. listening, you got to go to Melanie's website and I'll um, uh, MelaniePoulin.com because this series is so stylized and so epic and so colorful. Um, and obviously it's on your website. I was, I was blown away by it. And I was like, I need to speak to this artist because this is, this was so strange. And I, it's funny that you were, <laughs> so you actually, you actually researched and got old forensic files. That was how you, yeah. you recreated these scenes. Yeah, I, I like, you know, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to set up guidelines of rules. Like, what are my rules, which I always do with yeah. every series I start, you know, early on when I didn't know what I was doing, I was like, these are my rules. I have guidelines. So my guidelines are these real crime scenes have to be pre 1950. Ideally, they've lost the file. So you don't really know what's going on. It's a little bit, bit of a mystery. So you're kind of a detective. And um, you know, and, and I was intrigued by those because it made me ask a lot of questions about the photos. So I had, you know, in pre-1950 allowed the crime scene photos to be, they weren't affecting a family now. Like there was, there wasn't going to be a family like, oh my, that was my uncle. <laughs> so right. this, 
I didn't want that. It wasn't about that for me. It was more about how the 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 news exploits um, tragedy and people's loss. So I was playing with this idea and making it, dolling it up and glamorizing it. So yeah, I came across the archive and I hounded them and got more and more photos and worked with different I, thousands of these crime scene pictures I've come across, and I really tried to find the ones that impacted me the most to to recreate so um and, and was there a, was there a was the decision to work i mean just based on what i saw on your website and obviously we're, i've just kind of met you um mm -hmm. was there a conscious decision to only work with women yes i mean i did at one point shoot a man in this series but i kind of like pushed that aside because, because it was like the crime scenes was the feminine series and then later I did masculine series based on war and battle scene recreations which was really big series too violent so it was both violence like one is uh crime scenes you're kind of like the victim of the crime and then the war is the perpetrator um and it was masculine feminine so yes the crime scenes and it was also like that's primarily who's exploited in these situations like if the black dahlia is a perfect example of a crime scene where a beautiful woman was murdered in los angeles in the i guess it was the 40s 1940s and you know that became one of the def, def, like just one of the most memorable crime scenes ever because she was pretty and she was had the style and she was this interesting woman whereas that happens every day and if that just happens to joe blow a guy that nobody really picks up the news story it doesn't become this like epic story so it, but as i looked at it, it was like women are on the covers of magazines women are used to sell every product women are you know and it's like um so i i wanted to kind of exploit that the way the media was exploiting that to bring people back to this realization of what's happening in society it was a commentary on society so i don't know <laughs> it's a lot of talking that was interesting. But, no it's yeah. great i mean i'm just i'm i'm blown away like i first of all that i'm blown away that you made the leap from like being a journalist like a photojournalist or a documentary photographer working with musicians to mm. to to doing like highly conceptualized artwork based on, you know, murder scenes. Yeah. Um, from, well, that was also, but that the journalism and working in that world for me at the time, again, you know, we're going back to film. So, and I was young wow. and film was very expensive. So I found the way I learned photography was getting hired. I've always learned by getting work. Like I, I most often have had my art shows before I've made the next series. So I get an assignment, whether it's an art show or a photo, photojournalism. But at the time it was like photojournalism or a fashion work that I was doing was really interesting because you, you get free film and developing. So it was my way of going, okay, I don't have to spend a thousand dollars to buy this film and do the developing i can actually get paid for it i can own the photos and then um you know oh greg asked if it's hard was hard i'll let you out <laughs> hard to switch to digital um no it was not hard to switch to digital because um digital is super easy it's like uh, a lot of skateboarders i know uh, pro skaters that I've I've known over the years, I've, I'm like, what about snowboarding? They're like, that's the easiest thing ever. <laughs> Which right. I I don't claim to know that, so I don't know if that's true. But so Rocky <laughs> Rocky here is saying it's uh, it's awesome to be able to learn through your work. It's uh, yeah, it's great to have that freedom. I think because for me personally, um, working in China as a photographer when I was younger, um, I definitely had to go out on my own and build my own book. And I was yeah. working in film for many years as well. And um, so I, I would take all of my vacation time. I was working part-time as an English teacher and I would take oh. all of, um, and I would take any money I had and buy film. And then I would go out into the wilds of, of China and photograph people and places yeah. and ways of life and then come back, develop it on my own and then show it to like Time, Newsweek, Forbes, Fortune, New York Times, Wall Street oh, Journal I get to, get, it. Right, to get my right. work. 
And that was, that was how I had to pitch for my work because right. this was like, because I, I wasn't living in, in New York and LA. Like I couldn't, um, I, I mean, well, it was great because I, it was great because I was able to live in the place that I was documenting and I was able to keep my living expenses very low, which was, which was amazing, which means I was able to invest in myself much more. And, yes. um, and that's a really important step that a lot of people, uh, miss out on sometimes. And then they end up like assisting others forever. But I'm definitely yeah. envious of you being able to, you know, work and create through assignments. That's, that also means you're incredibly yeah. business savvy because you've got, <laughs> you know, you're, you're getting, you're getting paid to be creative and deliver, yeah. you know, an assignment or, or, or a show, which is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, and that was just, I mean, I mean, even getting paid, it was like, sometimes I would get, just get paid in film and developing at the time. And then later, you know, the business of photography is so different now. I mean, I don't know how old you are when that was happening, but the, um, you know, back in the day, there was a huge industry in stock photography. So you could, I would take pictures and I had an agent, I had a stock agent. And so once my pictures were taken, sometimes I would do work for a magazine for free, but I would own the pictures after a certain amount of time. And then I'd give it to my stock agent and they would sell it to some magazine in Germany and I'd make thousands of dollars on that. You know, it's like this whole network, but the, all of that has kind of, I don't quite know how that works now with stock photography and stuff. But I know like the big companies, sadly, you know, you hear I can, the, I can the tell big you. companies. <laughs> oh, you can? I, okay. Yeah. So, so I was working for all these big magazines and I would work on a day rate, um, oh. you know, from a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars and uh, whatever it happened to be. And then, and then I would always own the imagery afterwards. And then yes, um, so right. I was I was with Corbis Photography for a long time. Oh, you time were doing okay. My, yeah, and then now and now everything is Getty basically. So I have thousands yeah, and thousands of images with Getty, all from China. Oh, you do. In the, yeah, in the cool. early two thousands, and I generate an income from That's that. Cool. But over the last like yeah, ten years, it's dropping significantly. Like you know, they're, well, they're selling what pictures what online now. Yeah, it's terrible. For nothing, right? Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. That's what I was thinking because it used to be really expensive. Like, I would get yeah, like used to be sometimes, a... yeah, a thousand dollars. I used to pay my photo. rent on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I had times where it was like, okay, not only are they buying your stock photography, you're in an incredible magazine, you're getting paid thousands of dollars, you're getting a thousand a photo, whatever it is. Um, for them just to reuse, recycle your work. And now I, I would think I've heard from other stock photographers that it, it just plummeted. Like they, a lot of them actually used to make so much money. I knew people, they had like incredible houses in the Hollywood Hills. And it was just like, they would go out with their little camera and take a picture of a doorknob and upload it. And it was like all day. And those same people don't have those houses anymore. <laughs> Well, I, I grew up, I grew up with National Geographic at home and I thank my mother for that because yeah. she's always been a very avid traveler and, oh, that's and I great. grew up with, I grew up with Steve McCurry and Michael Yamashita, um, wow. you know, two great National Geographic photographers and they were kind of my heroes when I was young and they, they kind of got me excited about traveling and, and yeah, I mean, I can tell you like those guys are, those guys had massive stock uh, archives yeah. of, you know, no one's using anymore because people no there's one. youtubers there's instagrammers now that make more money than national geographic photographers and in oh, my yeah, world totally in my world that was the top of the top um to be That's a national top, geographic yeah. photographer that, but, what, but yeah. nowadays it, it's like nothing i mean yeah except you can still win a pulitzer prize i mean at least with photojournalist you can still win that if you're a photojournalist and you cannot win that on instagram <laughs> I what's don't think cost, you can. Though? What? What's the cost of still being a photojournalist? Like people ask yeah. me why I stopped doing photography and it's cuz it's cuz I went from making a really good living to being like borderline on the in poverty and then I was like oh, I need to start figuring out how to do other things. So luckily I like figured out how to make television and yeah. spun that into into a career and I'm so glad I did yeah. because it's given me a given me a lot of 
exciting opportunities. And it's like, you know, taking something terrible, which was the death of my photography career. So my photography career, yeah. you don't know the whole story. Um, yeah. When the, what, like 2008 was, was my best year ever and my worst year ever. So, you know, the, uh, 2008, we had the Summer Olympics in Beijing. So 2007, 2008, everyone wanted China content. So I was working every day on day rates wow. for Western magazines and newspapers. It was incredible. And then the Olympics came in August 2008. So that was the peak. And then September 2008, we had the Lehman's Brothers financial crisis. And then that just, that, that decimated the publishing industry. I mean, it decimated a lot of industries and mm -hmm. a lot of people lost their jobs and a lot of people lost their homes and it was terrible for so many people. But it also killed the publishing industry. So by 2009, I had about one fiftieth of my income that I had from the year oh, before. Like, right. and then 2010, it was worse. And then I was like, I gotta like figure out how to make a, a whole another career uh, and still mm -hmm. figure out how I can travel and tell stories and meet people. So that's yeah. how I made the transition because it was, it was over. Like people I mean, don't yeah. do what I did anymore. It was the same. I had a major show up at the time, one of the biggest in my life. And just prior to the financial meltdown, I had been selling art. You know, my photos sell for a lot. So that's kind of like how I'm lucky with photography is my prices have kind of go, gone up. I hope they stay up after all this. But, um, the, you know, I've been able to support myself through the art and um, but at that moment during the financial crisis, I had, I just had been working for two years straight every day. I was so exhausted and I just mounted my first, uh, major show in a few years and major meaning like what some people would do in a lifetime. Like I was working so hard, blood, sweat, and tears. And sure. it was just up and people were buying like crazy. And then that happened. And it, the whole world, similar, you know, to yeah. what's happening now, the world froze and yeah. where money was coming in, it was a year before it started to slowly trickle in. And it, it really like, um, you know, I've been fortunate in some ways because I can, with the income I've made from art, I've been able to ride things out. And I'm, you know, we're kind of in a very from different for different reasons we're kind of i think a lot of the 2009 people who lived through that were like okay whoa what's happening now yeah. <laughs> like we're riding are we riding this wave or what what is going to happen you know but yeah. you know you were smart and i think what you said about like you had to reevaluate your life i think a lot of people are having to do that in this moment right now like yeah. and people are questioning where they live, if they want to live in that city anymore, if they want to live in that home, if what about their jobs, they lost their jobs. So in a strange way, I feel like from what's happening, there might be like this mass migration, like people are going to leave the city, some people will go back, some people will, you know, I heard there's a lot of divorces happening, <laughs> new, new people, they're meeting new people, like there's a whole shift in the world. And we're evaluating our priorities and our situations and who we are like what we were doing every day is it going to be the same i don't know i get philosophical I, I, about have, it. <laughs> I have a question for you i have yeah. a question for you what is it like thanks rocky the mm -hmm. weeks the wish yeah he's great what do you what do you what how nervous and stressed and excited are you in the build-up to a massive gallery show like I, I've oh. never had that. I've never had that, um, uh, you know, that privilege to do. But what is yeah. that like putting together something that is going to be so heavily scrutinized and something that everyone is going to have a comment about? Like yeah. that must just yeah. keep you awake for weeks. That, that's a great. That's a great question. So I have a few answers to that. First of all, okay. the general answer and what I've learned from age. I'm 44 now, um, so you know, I've learned that um, failure, failure is scarier 
then the concept of failure for a lot of artists, I don't know about people in general, but you will fear failure more than death. So, you know, that, that, the idea of failing is in my experience, scarier than dying. <laughs> so there's that moment. And now, you know, with COVID and all this stuff, you know, you go, okay, well maybe dying is way scarier, but whatever. But, um, yeah, but the, the idea of failing is what holds people back. And, and so I always feel like anything important, I have to get that feeling. Like if I get that feeling of, oh my God, I'm so scared and I'm going to, I could fail and I can't sleep. I'm onto something good. And I really okay. can fail. You know, I really, yeah. it really could be a total, I've gotten the worst reviews before and I've been like, oh shit, I failed and you're just in this pit of your stomach, but you learn from that. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, no, you it's, know, it's so exciting yeah. because I, um, like, for example, I was, I was making for 10 months last year, I was filming one television show with discovery channel. Um, and it's a big 10 episode series and it comes out next month. Oh, and I'm freaking out so because, yeah. because I know half the people are going to hate it and half the people are going to love it if I'm lucky. Yeah. Yeah. And the people who don't like it are all on social media and they'll just oh. rip into me. And it's, you know and it's, and it's, it's, yeah. it's exhausting. It's exhausting. Well, Cause, Cause you know, yeah. you go to these, you go to these countries, you speak to people, you eat, you drink, mm -hmm. you whatever. Um, and you know, some people are going to just, just, you know, say terrible rip things to you afterwards. But yeah. here's the thing. But I so I thought that, yeah, no, I've had that. Like I did crime scenes. I mean, people, some people hated me so much. Yeah. That, um, I've gone through, I've had the bad reviews and then it went up to good reviews. And at first, like, you know, and I'm totally like, I was raised by feminists, but feminists hated me. Like, oh, how dare you? And I'm like, no, no, guys, you don't get it. You don't get it. Like, come on. Yeah. So, and then I went from that to being understood and being like, kind of like, oh, hey, whoa, what about Melanie Pullen? Like, yes, yay, you're on our side. So, uh, but the whole thing with, um like people and i love people but you you can't sit and worry about what people think you have to always create it <laughs> hi people uh you have to create hey susan you have to yeah. that's a good friend of mine and another great photographer woman yeah. working in the industry um uh, so yeah you gotta really um stay uh true to yourself like the the only time i've seen work that i didn't like of my you know later you in hindsight you look at some work and you're like i don't really like that um was when maybe i wasn't true to myself like i started doing it for someone else because it really right. comes down to soul like this you know what like a jazz musician or a musician it's like it got soul and that was like you need that in every piece of art that you create. You need soul. And that is you. That's not yeah. where if you're a musician and you're like, I'm going to play what people like. You're just a guy in a, you know, you may as well go play on a, play at a, I was going to say a cruise ship, but don't, don't do that. Don't play on a cruise ship. <laughs> Whoa. No. Yeah. No, but I mean, you're just not, you need soul. You know, the concept of soul should show up in whatever, work you do and um you know i'm a lot of like blade runner was hated and nobody liked blade runner yet it you know that film has got soul and it's a, a legendary film it had to ride the wave of like all the people that hated it getting slammed and then now it's like one of the great movies you know it's like one of the defining yeah it's the ultimate so it's like i don't worry my advice and maybe you're not that worried but yeah i'm sure it's you it's your life on the line in your work but at the same time it's like you did it you know you're like i lived it i did it take it or leave it and probably the people that don't like it or you know whatever hopefully jealous. they're jealous yeah maybe angry. they're jealous you know angry yeah, yeah who knows i got, who knows? I got that i got that a lot actually i i did a motor i did a few motorcycle shows a long time ago and yeah and people, people were, you know, a lot of people really didn't like them. And, but a lot oh. of people loved them. And uh, it was very decisive, divisive because I, I did trips in China and India and Brazil. And people said, oh, I focused too much on this or I didn't focus enough on these things and whatever. And it was just like, man, I just rode a motorcycle like 
I just did like a dream <laughs> trip. You know, like, let's just enjoy the ride, man. Um, yeah. Let's kind yeah. of relax a little bit. And, you know, I, I um, but yeah, who knows? You can't make everyone happy all the time. You just got to stick, stick to your guns. Yeah, you just stick to your focus. It. And frankly, if you didn't make it, there'd be nothing to criticize. So, you know, you've done your job in that. <laughs> it's like you made it let the the critiques or whatever <laughs> yeah. then you just if you're gonna if yeah if you're gonna live a public life people are gonna shit on you yeah yeah it's true i mean it's a, yeah. and i still less so but at first i was one of the things i found too speaking of people really hating me i've i've had people really hate me um hate me for making the art i've made um so I, one of the things I found early on was like, sometimes people, the people that hated me the most would go to my art shows the most. They would yeah. go over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, I, one lady hated me so much. She wrote me, I did a talk at a college. She wrote me an 11 page letter and sent it to the headmaster of the school. And I was like, this is kind of great. You know, like this woman really didn't get what I was doing, first of all. But not only that, like my work actually got so under her skin that she took the time to write 11 pages about how much yeah. she hated me <laughs> and my work. Sure. And I was like, I saved that letter because I was like, this is really interesting. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not taking pictures of butterflies. And the if I were out in the world taking pictures of butterflies, I don't think I would really make people think that much. But the work, really, in, in the end, it's just something on a piece of paper. But that yeah. imagery gets in their head and, like, it gets the ball rolling. So it impacts people. It's impacting something in them. So whatever sure. it is that they don't like, it actually has to do with something inside themselves like it's it's so you're whatever you're doing like if they do it differently or whatever that it has to do with something going on inside of them so you're getting to people i don't i don't kill butterflies damien hurst did <laughs> no damien hurst. killed a lot damien of butterflies done, done, done a lot of things um yeah, they were pretty, so we've got <laughs> we've, we've got about we got a couple minutes left here one mm -hmm. question i want to ask you is how creative are you feeling during this lockdown because it is stifling uh, my creativity i am not feeling creative at all i i don't know i'm sh I, I talk to some artist friends and they're like oh yeah it's like nothing's happening i'm painting and sculpting i'm doing i'm like i'm not like no i just don't have a lot of energy i mean i'm going through a lot of archives but you know i have my little boy here he's nine and um he's homeschooling like we're I'm what <laughs> I'm now a teacher at home. So yeah. the whole the whole thing has been it's a uh, rough but I'm learning from it. Like something from this time will lead to um you know will lead to future things and you know we're always learning and reflecting on what's happening. So I think if you're not creative right now you it will like be letting out of a like a something where you're under all this pressure and you're suddenly you're out and you're like Phew. yeah so yeah i think it'll I hope, so. I hope so yeah we don't know what's yeah. gonna happen but i think that that will uh for some people it might not like maybe they'll just forever be it, oh their creativity is just gone forever from this no, I'm just I don't kidding. think it's gone. I I'm don't joking. think it's gone forever, but I'm no. I'm definitely one of these people that loves the hustle, loves the bustle, loves mm -hmm. to be out, loves to meet new people, loves to be traveling all the time, and I generate so much energy for my work through yeah. that energy of of moving. Like right. you know, George Clooney has this great line in his movie Up in the Air, uh, where he where he plays that guy who travels all around the uh, the U.S. firing people. He's like mm -hmm. a firing consultant. <laughs> and he said, like, at one point in the movie, he was just like, moving is living. And, oh. and I've kind of embodied that in so many ways and taken that to heart. And, and right now I just feel, wow. you know, stuck. And Rocky here says maybe I, I seem inspired. But, you know, me talking this through with friends and other yeah. creative people, uh, people in my industry, people who, are, you know, who I uh, 
admire and look up to and, and new friends like you. Like, it, it helps me through this process because yeah. without it, I'd just be drinking. No, I feel like, you know, you're good. You definitely, like, it's like a boiling pot of water. You're building the steam up and it's, um, you, the, you can't help but learn from this moment. Like, you know, I know it's, yeah. it's an emotional roller coaster for everyone, but there is, um, thanks Rocky. Yeah, there's great, you're, you are learning something. It's something right. there that you're going to inevitably, uh, me too, we're inevitably going to be impacted by this. And it's a learning curve. I feel like we all got kind of lazy on earth. Like uh, things were easy. And I don't think things are supposed to be easy. I, they're not. We're on a, I always say this, it's kind of a joke. and I, But it's true. We live on a ball floating through tumultuous space and you know these things that we think are so important and you know like what's happening it, maybe it's a little different than that maybe the idea of living in a house with everything perfect and quiet and this and that maybe that's weird you know maybe we're yeah. supposed to have crazy stuff going on maybe it's supposed maybe everything we know should be shift and change because that's history that's the way the earth you know we're on this create you're seeing it all the time there's endless possibilities so you take what we're given right now and you uh you know you you use it to create new things and new worlds and new realms and yeah you know, you're in a great position with your shows i just watched the whole season of uh that documentary alone <laughs> That, oh, did you? Have you seen that? Yeah. But no. I, I, like, your show is so perfect for right now because it, it was, like, kind of these guys go to this island, Vancouver Island, and they're stuck. They're, they only have their own cameras, and they have to survive on this island. And it's like, you know, I'm watching it from inside this apartment. I, there, it's not easy to get out of right now. And um, you're like, wow, the world, and it's great. So, like, your show and go looking at all of that is like so wonderful for people right now. And having gone through this, it's like exactly what people need to see and be reminded of. Like, in yourself, Absolutely. you have to watch your own footage <laughs> from your apartment yeah. in Istanbul. <laughs> Try so. We've got yeah. we got two minutes left. Okay, we've got two minutes left. Um. So what is the first thing you're going to do when you can leave the house freely and travel freely? Wow, I haven't really. Oh, I do know. I told friends, I said, we have to, because we think we're going to be traumatized from this. Um, I said, we got to pack our tents up and go camping for a week. Get to nature. Get back to nature. Go hiking, camping. And I, have, I want to go up to Northern California. I love it. I traveled all through. Europe with my son last year and at the end of the year we went camping up at um towards Monterey at Royal Seco and swimming through rivers and gorges and I was like that was better than all of it I don't want to visit cities I want to go to nature I want to be in a tent I want to be scared of bears <laughs> that so, sounds exactly like my uh, extreme treks television show so we should get you out on an episode Okay, yeah. I'll take some video of the city girl in the tent with her finger spread. I'm so terrified of the nights outdoors. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I love it. I would love to do that. That's So that's my plan. And I hope some friends will join me and will remember what that was like, because that's a luxury in all this. Yeah. And I find being out in nature very uh, stress relieving. And I, oh, and it it's helps amazing. keep me balanced. And, uh, and I just want to get back to work. I just want to get back to trekking and climbing and making content that people can watch at home when they're not able to travel, which is kind of my job. So that's, that's I love what that I need to get back that. to. Yeah, yeah and, and thank you. I mean, we need these things that you do. And we'll be needing it more than ever to remind people, like, look, there's a world out there. You don't need to be trapped in this city. So. Yeah. So uh, Rocky is saying thank you for uh, introducing us to Melanie. Melanie was able to look through your website, really high level work. Wow. Oh, thanks. That's thank amazing. You, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, so Melanie, that's it for today. We're about to run okay. out of time. Instagram only gives us an hour. That went by so quickly. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, nice talking to you. Yeah. Thank, Stay thank safe. Thank you. Um, 
and good luck trying to be creative in Los Angeles okay. and keep, keep washing your hands. Yeah, I'm washing my, my hands are exactly you too. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Ryan. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. See you later. Bye. Okay, guys, that was um, the fantastic artist Melanie Poulin. And for any of you who uh, want to watch this again, please check out my YouTube channel, Ryan J. Pyle. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Bye bye.